Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Miller, and I am a JDC board member and the chair of the Archives Committee. I am pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. The JDC Archives holds the records of JDC since its creation about 105 years ago. As such, it is one of the most important expository repositories for the study of modern Jewish history. Visiting scholars from around the world, as well as publishers, journalists, and family researchers, curators, filmmakers, and others use our collections for their research. We also offer fellowships to enable scholars to conduct research in the JDC archives. Our speaker today is Spee Gittleman. He is Professor Emeritus of Political Science and the Preston Tisch Professor Emeritus of Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. He has written or edited 19 books and many articles on Soviet, Eastern European and Israeli politics. They include Jewish identities in post-communist Russia and Ukraine on uncertain ethnicity and the new Jewish diaspora, Russian speaking immigrants in Israel, the US and Germany. Svi's current research is on Soviet Jewry in combat in World War II and on the politics of history in the former Soviet states. Svi is a JDC board member and a member of the Archives Committee. The title of the lecture today is Tread Treading Lightly Back into the USSR, the Joint Returns After Half a Century. Our format is that the speaker will present for 45 minutes and this will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Please note that your microphones are turned off and we will take questions via the Q&A function. You can send us questions at any time during the lecture. Svi will now start his lecture. And I just wanna just, as a personal note, I heard Svi about six years ago in Washington. He spoke at a JDC board meeting and he's fantastic. I am so looking forward to this lecture. And Svi, without further ado, it's up to you. You're on. Thanks very much, Debbie. I appreciate your remarks. I want to start by welcoming everyone and also thanking the staff at the Joint in the Archives section, particularly Isabella Rohr, Abra Cohen, Misha Mitzel, Linda Levy, for the assistance that they provided me and also to thank Amir Shaviv of the joint for the interview that I did with him. What I'd like to do today is go through what I consider four stages of Soviet policy towards Jews and Jews reactions toward those policies and use the prism of the Joint Distribution Committee to view those policies and in turn view the JDC activities through the evolution of Soviet Jewish interactions. I think the joint was involved in three out of the four stages that I'm going to describe. The four stages are, first of all, the destruction of the traditional Jewish way of life following the revolution of 1917 which ultimately in October, November of that year brought the Bolsheviks to power. That policy involved the annihilation, extirpation of the traditional Jewish way of life, which means, first of all, religion, and the Bolsheviks were opposed to all religions, not just to Judaism. Secondly, Zionism, and the Bolsheviks were opposed to all nationalisms, not just Jewish nationalism. In fact, they were even opposed to Russian nationalism. And they looked forward to a world which would be defined by what they called proletarian internationalism, where everyone would get along and there would be no differences among ethnic groups, nationalities, and religions. The third stage, 
of the uh, or the third uh, aspect of traditional Judaism or Jewishness that the Bolsheviks were determined to uproot was strangely enough, the Hebrew language. They had been convinced by Yiddishist Jews that Hebrew was the language of the exploiting classes of the rabbis and other religious functionaries of the Zionists and of upper class Jews who pretentiously try to use Hebrew, whereas Yiddish was the language of what they called the horapashne masen, the toiling masses, the ordinary Jews, the working class Jews, and therefore Yiddish, not Hebrew, should be the official language, Jewish language of the Soviet Union, and they won out. The second stage of Soviet policy was a constructive stage. If you have now abolished the old ways of being Jewish, what are you going to substitute for it? The communists or Bolsheviks settled on an attempt to transform Jewish life into a secular, socialist, Soviet way of life, which I'll describe briefly. That attempt was made for about 10 to 15 years, beginning in the early 1920s, and ending in the middle of the following decade. A third stage, highly surprising to convince socialism, socialists, was an explicitly anti-Semitic policy which was pursued by the Soviet government and which seemed to resonate very much with Soviet society beginning around 1948 and continuing up through the 1980s, although taking different forms at different times. Remember that this stage of official anti-Semitism begins just three years after the total annihilation of two and a half million Jews in the Holocaust. Let's put that into context, however about 27 million Soviet citizens lost their lives during World War II, far, far eclipsing any other country, including Germany itself. And about 10% of the victims of the German-led occupation, accompanied by collaboration of locals, about 10% of those who were victimized were Jews, even though they were fewer than 2% of the Soviet population. The death of Stalin four days after Purim in 1953 meant a diminution in anti Semitism, though it continued in subtler, less public forms. There were decades of relegation of Jews to the margins of society and successive Soviet governments and party leaders consigned Jews to a kind of second class citizenship where they were not trusted fully. They were not allowed into the predominant hierarchies of the Soviet Union and they were deprived of all cultural facilities. There was not a single Jewish school of any kind in the Soviet Union after 1948. There were no Jewish organizations, social, intellectual life, and indeed for a long period of time, there was no contact with any Jews outside the USSR. The fourth and final stage that I discern is the reconstruction of autonomous Jewish public life at the same time as mass emigration takes place. And we'll reflect a little bit on that complex relationship later on. This stage of relaxation and openness is the result of the new policies of glasnost and perestroika namely candidness, openness, and reconstruction, initiated by Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, who accedes to power, becomes the first secretary of the Soviet Communist Party 
1985, and two or three years later begins to implement this policy. As so often happens, what he began in the late 1980s as an attempt to rescue the system through reconstructing it ended with the destruction and the dissolution of the Soviet system itself, as we all well know. As I said, the Joint Distribution Committee was involved in three of those stages, and I want to begin by describing how it was involved. As many of you know, the Joint was established in 1914 in order to provide rescue and relief to those who had suffered during the First World War. Soviet Jews or Russian Jews, those who had lived in the Tsarist Empire, went through a series of catastrophic conflicts and were victimized by them. First, you had the First World War in which half a million Russian Jews served in the Tsarist army. And many of the battles of that war were fought in the Pale of Settlement, that restricted area in Western Russia, where 97% of the Jewish population was forced to live until 1917. That was followed by the Russian Revolution of 1917, 1918, and then came a catastrophic, traumatic, so-called civil war, which most of us have forgotten about because it was overshadowed by the Holocaust just 20 years later. That civil war lasted from about 1918 or 19 to 1921, and that devastated large parts of the old Pale of Settlement. That was a multilateral war. It was not, strictly speaking, just a civil war. You had the Russian Bolsheviks fighting the Poles, who had sought to gain independence after 123 years of non-independence and being carved up between the uh, Germans, the Austrians, and the Russians. You had also Ukrainian nationalists versus Russians of all stripes attempting to gain independence. You had anarchists, you had Ukrainian chieftains who had no ideology but simply wanted to loot. And you had a major war between the whites, the restorationists who wanted to bring back Tsarism and the Reds, the Bolsheviks who had made the revolution. The consequences of these multilateral wars on territories heavily populated by Jews, you can see in this slide. Pogroms, the common denominator of all the forces, except for the Bolsheviks, was Bejidov Spasai Rasi, beat the Jews and save Russia. Now, the logic of that equation escapes me and probably most of you, but the Jews were universally perceived, again, aside from the Bolsheviks, as the enemy. In the left hand slide, you see a brother and a sister who are bending over the bodies of their parents. And on the right side, you see victims of the pogroms of several ages. And these were the kinds of people that the Joint Distribution Committee, among others, tried to help during a time of their travail. The pogroms were upfront, in your face, and horrendous. Men were buried in the soil up to their necks, and then horses were driven over them. Um, or people were pulled apart, literally pulled apart by horses moving in different directions. Children were smashed against the wall in the full view of their parents. Obviously, this foreshadowed what was to happen 20 years later under the Nazis. Pregnant women were a favorite target. Their unborn children killed in their mother's sight. Thousands of women were raped, and hundreds of them were left insane by their experiences. 
It's estimated that in 1918, 1921, there were more than 2000 pogroms, about half of them occurring in Ukraine. My colleague, Jeff Weidlinger is about to publish a book and his on the uh, pogroms, and his estimate is that about 100,000 Jews were killed. Uh, that number seems to pale in light of the 6 million that were killed, many of them in the same territories, just two decades later. But 100,000 victims is an enormous number when you think about each individual. That is why the joint involved itself in relief. Abra, if we can have the next slide. The sign in Russian says, this uh, institution, Utsrezdenye, is subsidized by the joint. And this was in Ukraine in 1922. Take a careful look at the shoes of some of these people. The little child standing in the front. He's fortunate enough to have any shoes at all, but see how they are torn. Look at the faces, look at the clothing, both genders, young, old, a soup kitchen, providing food for those in need. Okay, we can take that slide down. Now, um, let's not show this yet. Let's, let's hold it in abeyance, please. In the first decade of Soviet rule, until 1928, the policy was to upend traditional Jewish life, as I mentioned. But what were you going to substitute for religion, for Yiddish, for Hebrew, Jewish culture in general, Jewish customs, traditions? Well, there was a debate about that. Some said, substitute nothing. Let the Jews lead the way as they so often have in social movements toward complete assimilation. Let them be the first among all the nations to disappear, lose their particular ethnic specificity and become part of the world working class. After all, religion and ethnicity are simply inventions of the capitalists to keep the working class divided against each other, therefore weakening it and disenabling it from revolt against capitalism. The second school of thought was, well, we're not in favor of pushing assimilation and we're not in favor of preserving Jewish culture in any form, let's just let nature take its course and see what happens. The third school of thought was, let's preserve the Jews as an ethnic entity, but let us transform it radically and find some way to turn this petty bourgeois group of merchants and traders and small town dwellers into a secularized ethnic group no different from any other working group, except perhaps by language and maybe in the long run by territory. Yes, in the longer run, Jews like everyone else, Russians, Ukrainians, Georgians, Armenians, Uzbeks, Tajiks, and so on, will all blend together in one united humankind. But for the time being, let the Jews have a different form of culture, but a culture of their own, just as we're going to try with the other nationalities or ethnic groups of the former Russian empire, now the Soviet Union. How are you gonna do this? I think there were three programs that the Bolsheviks launched, two of which were unsuccessful, and one of which was eminently successful. The first program chronologically was Yiddishization. Well, if the Jews are to have a secular culture of their own, 
there is already a Yiddish secular culture, which was created and developed already in the 19th century, although Yiddish goes back way longer than that. And what we have to do is make Yiddish the Jewish language in which Jews will operate. They will operate in it as workers, as peasants, and even as party members. We'll have Yiddish schools, we'll have newspapers, magazines, theaters, even courts. The Soviets were sincere. In 1931, there were 1,100 Yiddish elementary schools, all paid for by the government. No other government in history ever sponsored such a large network of Yiddish schools. And all of them had disappeared by the following decade, by the end of the following decade. That was for two reasons. One, the Jews themselves didn't want it. Like their American cousins, they dropped Yiddish in favor of the dominant reigning language, in our case, English, in their case, Russian. Because just as English was in the United States, so Russian was in the Soviet Union, the key to upward mobility, the key to higher education, to vocational and professional success. The second program was urbanization and industrialization. And that was the winner. In its massive industrialization drive, begun in 1928, in the first of the five-year plans, thousands and thousands of Jews, especially young Jews, flowed out of the economically ruined Shtetlach, the small towns, toward the larger cities, which were the centers of new industry and the redevelopment of old industry. Young Jews went to Siberia to build new cities, such as Kamsamolsk, named for the Communist Youth League, Magnitogorsk. They flowed into especially Moscow and Leningrad, where most Jews had been barred from living before the revolution. So they eagerly seized the opportunities in secular life, in education, to take advantage of these opportunities that the Soviet system had offered them. And by 1927, 13% of all students in higher education were Jewish, less than 2% of the population, 13% of college university students. Whereas before the revolution, there was a quota system, a so-called numerus clausus, which kept the percentage of Jewish students in such institutions very low. The third program that was to revolutionize the Jews and at the same time preserve them as a cultural and ethnic group was settlement on the land as farmers or peasants. Now, this was not a new idea. It was quite popular in the 19th century. If you think of the image of the noble savage, Montaigne, the French political theorist, not Rousseau, as many people mistakenly think, talked about the noble savage. So Native Americans or American Indians or whatever the current term may be, were praised for their virtuous life as agriculturalists, as simple but pure people. Um, those of you who've read Tolstoy's great novel, Anna Karenina, may remember the image of the landowner Levin going out to the peasants and working alongside the peasants in bringing in their harvest and feeling some kind of spiritual renewal as he engaged with the land and with agriculture directly. And we need cite no other example than the Zionists. The early Zionists believed that agricultural colonization, the construction of colonies in Palestine, later on of kibbutzim and moshavim, was the solution to what Europeans called the Jewish problem. Baron de Hirsch in Belgium paid for hundreds, maybe thousands of Jews to emigrate to the Pampas of Argentina and become Jewish farmers 
in towns called Moisesville and the like. Jewish farms were established in this country by the Amolam movement, by the Jewish Agricultural Association in places such as Oregon, North Dakota, Connecticut, and not so far from where I live in Bad Axe, Michigan. So the idea was to make the Jews productive, to help them economically, and to reverse the situation of the Jew of, as someone who could not work the land. By law, Jews were not allowed to own land in the Tsarist empire. At the same time, as four out of five residents of that empire derived their income from agriculture. So the Jews were excluded from the main way of earning a living. And now the Soviet government, in contrast to its predecessor, would provide them with a way of making a living. Uh, it's come back in fashion, at least among a small group in this country. We have um, American young Jews who co are committed to sustainability and organic farming. Some of them, in fact, combining it with Yiddish culture, uh, the farm in Connecticut that calls itself Adama or land in Hebrew, uh, Yesod in North Carolina, Midbar in Tucson, and a uh, Jewish farmers network, which today claims about 800 members. Now, when the Bolsheviks consolidated their power, the Soviet Union was in ruins. And Soviet reality was very harsh. The United States, not the government, but American citizens offered assistance to the USSR. The United States did not recognize the Soviet Union until December 1933, did not recognize it diplomatically. But there was an organization called American Relief Administration, headed by Herbert Hoover, before he was president, which offered assistance to the impoverished Soviet masses. Ideology and, ten and um, practical considerations were in tension. The Bolsheviks at first advocated ideologically based utopian schemes, abolish money, it's a capitalist trait, abolish marriage, oppression of women, uh, let the industries be were run by the workers themselves. All of these were quickly abandoned as impractical. So they had this ideology, but it wasn't working. They believed that there would soon be a world revolution and its greatest proponent was a Jew by the name of Lev Davidovich Bronstein, better known to you as Trotsky. And he believed that there was no need for a Soviet foreign policy because he would issue a few revolutionary proclamations and the workers in Germany and Britain and France and even the United States would rise up and the entire world would become socialist. As Trotsky's father who did speak Yiddish may have, may have said, nicht gestegen, nicht geflegen, didn't happen. So the Bolsheviks reluctantly accepted aid from capitalists. They could reason dialectically, if the capitalists give us aid, we should take it because it will strengthen us. And then we will defeat the capitalists, the very people who gave us aid. Might be ingrateful, ungrateful, but that's the way Marx said history works. Jewish colonies, agricultural colonies, would serve another purpose, not only rehabilitating Jews, making them productive, not only helping the Soviet Union, but showing up the Zionists. We'll do better than the Zionists who are competing with us for the loyalties of the Jews while they are establishing similar colonies in Palestine. Abra, could you show the living quarters? So 
So they decided to establish Jewish farming settlements, primarily in Ukraine and Belarus, which had been part of the Pale of Settlement, and in Crimea. Later on, they came up with the scheme of Birobijan, which we won't have time to discuss, and which is to this day in Russia called the Yevreske Avtonomneya Oblasts, the Jewish Autonomous Province, where maybe 1% of the population is, uh, is Jewish, but that's another story. Now, when Jews went to these colonies, these colonies, for the most part, with some exceptions, had not before existed. There were some Jewish colonies that went back to the mid and early 19th century. But before they could really build up a colony, they would be living in the kind of quarters that you see here. Rather primitive, rather simple, and certainly collective. The joint decided that it would help such colonies, and it spent in the early 1920s over $18 million for Russian relief. And that was when a dollar was a dollar. So $18 million, uh, which is today the, what, the average salary of an NBA basketball player for one season, um, that's American priorities. Uh, $18 million was a lot of money. Most of it was funneled through the American Relief Administration known, as I said, as the ARA. Russian Jews learned these letters, A-R-A. Was meint das? What does it mean? Ah, they said, America ratevet alemon. America saves all. That's Yiddish, of course. It didn't mean that at all, but in effect, that's what it was. In 1924, the joint allocated nearly $10 million for relief and reconstruction supplied tractors, as you'll see in the next slide, livestock, agricultural implements, and horses. Where was that tractor made? John Deere was not a Soviet firm. The joint bought tractors, shipped them to the Soviet Union, to Jewish farming colonies. And by 1928, there were 220,000 Jewish farmers, whereas before the revolution, there were probably maybe a thousand or around that number. And by the mid 1930s, the joint had expended $14 million on agricultural work and another $10 million on other assistance. So the joint was not only involved in setting up and helping these colonies, but it was providing other forms of assistance to those who needed it. The project to settle Jews on land, unlike the one in Palestine or Israel, did not succeed in the Soviet Union. It did not attract the kind of poor people that they hoped to attract. There were not enough books, newspapers, and entertainment. There were too few schools, and the colonies also were used, according to the Soviet critics of the colonies, as hiding places for religious Jews, Abra, next slide, please, who were safer in the colonies where there were no non-Jews and where the communist parties presence was minimal than they were in the large cities where they would be strongly dissuaded from practicing religion. The colonies even attracted some Zionists who said, well, if we can't get out and go to Palestine, let's at least gain the skills needed for the day that we can go there. Moreover, in many places, particularly in Ukraine and Crimea, peasants were hostile to the idea of Jews coming into their land and, as they saw it, seizing it. I would say that the next and greatest blow to the Jewish agricultural enterprise was the collectivization of agriculture, meaning 
there was no more private ownership or working of land, but beginning in 1928, peasants were forced to give up their land and to enter into collective farms. About 8 million peasants died because they resisted the collectivization of their land. And for Jews, there was also the internationalization, quote unquote, of the land, namely Jewish farms had to integrate, mix with Ukrainian farms, Belarusian farms, Russian farms, and so on. So by February of 1930, it was reported that 70% of all the settlers who had come to Crimea had left the land. It's a reasonable estimate to say that from a peak of 220,000 Jewish land workers in 1928, the number was down to less than half of that on the eve of World War II. Abra, you could take down this slide, please. And by 1938, ORT, which many of you are familiar with, AgroJoint, which was the JDC sponsored organization, which was behind the agricultural effort in the Soviet Union and two other leftist Jewish agricultural organizations had ceased their operations in the USSR. Now, contrary to common belief, the joint was actually not expelled from the Soviet Union in 1938, it withdrew. In an indirect manner, it was expelled. Dr. Joseph Rosen, the brilliant agronomist and overall organizer of Jewish agriculture in the USSR, explained that it was time to leave for two reasons. One, the mission had been accomplished. Soviet Jews had gotten sufficient aid to become self-sufficient farmers. Two was a more sinister reason. About 30 employees of the agro joint had been purged, most of them killed. And Misha Mitzel has written an excellent article on this subject. Now, if agro joint people were being arrested, charged as being foreign spies and being executed, clearly the Soviet government no longer wanted this effort to continue. Nevertheless, Dr. Rosen wrote with satisfaction, quote, what a tremendous change for the better has taken place in the USSR and what a potent part in the improvement of the Jewish situation, the work of our organization, JDC, has played. It had established 133 Jewish collective farms in Ukraine alone, 85 farms in Crimea, a total of 218 farms in which over 13,000 Jewish families lived. And other farms were established under different auspices. And Dr. Rosen pointed something out that we're going to hear again in the 1990s. We're not here for the long run. We, the joint, are planting seeds. Those seeds will have to be nurtured, grown, and cared for by the local people. And uh, that remains the philosophy of the joint, even though it may not have worked out in practice. So, from the viewpoint of Soviet Jews, the one program that succeeded was industrialization and urbanization. It gave them education, vocations, and standards of living that their forebears could only dream of. My Zeta might have been a plain and possibly illiterate cobbler. My father was now a skilled worker in a factory. And I, the second generation born under Soviet rule, I am an engineer or a scientist. 
from a collective national Jewish point of view, the success of this effort was greatly diminished because its results were acculturation to the Russian language, abandoning of Hebrew and Yiddish, the loss of any religion, and a constantly rise, a constant rise in the proportion of Jews who married non-Jews and their children identifying officially and unofficially as the non-Jewish parents' nationality. Jewish tradition went down as individual Jews went up. The third phase of Soviet Jewish history is the one I referred to at the beginning as explicit anti-Semitism. And here for reasons I frankly don't understand, the joint played the role inadvertently as the bête noire of the nightmare of the Soviet government. It lingered in the shadows of the Soviet collective mind of Stalin's mind long after it had departed from the USSR. 10 years afterwards, 1948, they were still worried about the joint. And in 1948, all Yiddish activity was stopped by the government, secular Yiddish activity. All Yiddish theaters, newspapers, publishing houses, magazines, museums, all of these were closed. Leading Jewish cultural figures were arrested. There was a campaign against rootless cosmopolitans, people without a distinct ethnicity, people with loyalties abroad, people who were not really true Soviet citizens, well, it was easy to guess who they were when they were named by name. Finkelstein, Goldenberg, Kogan, Levy, Itagda, and so on. Jews who had served in the courts, the military, the police, the Communist Party, Soviet government, these were purged and no other Jews were allowed in except for a very, very few individuals. On August 12th, 1952, about 20 of the leading Jewish cultural activists were shot as enemies of the people, traitors to the homeland, after mock trials in which they were beaten into submission and forced to confess. And then on the 13th of January, 1953, Pravda, the official newspaper of the Communist Party, on its front page came out with a large headline, murderers in white coats, Jews as killers, meaning that, well, uh, you can see you can see it in this in this uh, caricature, which appeared in Crocodile. Crocodile was the Soviet humor magazine, but this was not funny. The uh, menacing figure wearing a physician's gown is a Jew, and in the uh, Russian background, you can you can't see it; it's too small. The joint is mentioned, and the joint is mentioned at the bottom as well. If you see that American dollar sitting in a cap, at the bottom of the dollar sign is joint. Why? Because the doctors, nine of whom were mentioned, six of whom were Jews, the doctors were supposedly in the pay of the joint. And the joint, in turn, was a front, or front organization for the CIA. I'll quote to you from Pravda of that day. The majority of the participants of the terrorist group were brought by American intelligence. They were recruited by the international Jewish bourgeois nationalist organization called Joint. The filthy face of this Zionist spy organization, covering up their vicious actions under the mask of charity, is now completely revealed. 
unmasking the gang of poisoner doctors struck a blow against the International Jewish Zionist Organization. Now, all can see what sort of philanthropists and friends of peace, of peace hide behind the signboard of the joint. Can we see the next slide? So this slide shows a, a chicken and the word oschipani means plucked or also wretched and pitiful. The background is clearly New York City. The dollar sign is prominent. And at the bottom against the black background, it says joint. So the joint is this vulture, I would say, not a chicken, a vulture, which is sucking the blood out of the Soviet Union, but the Soviets have triumphed by uncovering the conspiracy and unmasking these horrible doctors. The last stage that we'll discuss, I'm calling collapse and reconstruction. We can take down this slide now. In the late 1980s, as censorship and other restrictions were relaxed in the Soviet Union, people inside the country and outside had a hard time figuring out what was really going on. Was Gorbachev, who was a loyal communist, had been in the Politburo for a number of years, the highest organ of the party in charge of agriculture he was, was he really serious about allowing organizations to rise, to form, and to act without government approval? Jewish organizations were allowed to spring up along with thousands of others. And by December 1989, there were three, four, even 500 such organizations who met in Moscow publicly to found the Va'ad, the National Jewish Congress, a kind of organization that had not existed since the revolution. I was in China in the spring of 1987 and I was addressed, uh, I was invited to address a, um, a group of Chinese military and also a research institute of the Communist Party. You know, we have a saying in Hebrew, it's in the ethics of the fathers in Pikei Avot. It means where there's no mensch, try to be a mensch yourself. So the Yiddish witticism is ish, in a place where there is no ish, there is no mensch, is a herring a fish. A little herring is also considered a fish. So I was the herring. Why the Chinese were interested in my opinion about what Gorbachev was doing uh, was obviously a mistake on their part. But anyway, I told them, I thought Gorbachev was serious and I thought this was real. I had the same experience with the joint. It's a little different than being in Beijing. I had seen the joint in operation uh, when Michael Schneider was running its operations in Romania. I'd been in contact with uh, the great Ralph Goldman. And uh, Amir Shaviv reminds me that I gave a talk to the joint in 1988 or 1989 where I titled it Schreck und Hoffnung, Schreck und Hoffnung, Fear and Hope. This was the title of an essay that the great Yiddish writer Yitzhak Leibush Peretz wrote around 1906 when he assessed the Jewish socialist movement. And he said, on the one hand, I'm scared what this might lead to. On the other hand, I hope it brings great things. And that's the way many of us felt about Gorbachev Perestroika, Glasnost, and the Jews of the Soviet Union. Who knows what might happen? But on the other hand, it looked pretty hopeful. 
1986, Ralph Goldman, the executive vice president of the joint, had an opportunity to talk to Konstantin Kharchev. Kharchev was the chairman of the Council of Religious Affairs in the Soviet Union, not even a ministry, a rather minor organization, but it was an opening. And he told Kharchev about the Joint Distribution Committee. And there were low level contacts between the joint and the Soviets in the following years until January, 1988, when Ralph Goldman led a JDC delegation to Moscow. In the archives, there's a message from Ralph to all of his travelers saying, don't meet with three Fusniks, don't meet privately with any Soviet citizen, assume that your rooms are bugged, comport yourself with decorum and caution. Be careful. And that was the joint's approach, as many others approach was, to this new development in the USSR. It's interesting that both the joint and the Soviet government operated on the level of religion, not culture, not civil rights, but religion, because religion was inoffensive. It was, there was no other Soviet government agency except for the emigration officials and the secret police, the KGB, that was dealing with Jewish matters. Well, religion, okay, there is some Judaism. There are about 50 synagogues open in the Soviet Union. Let's talk about Jewish religious rights. And one of the early gifts that the joint um, provided to a Jewish community in Kiev, this was in 1989, I found it in the um, archive, was a machine that could pluck 70 to 140 chickens per hour. So kosher chicken would now be available in Kiev. Now it reminded me of that vulture poster and plucking its feathers. This maybe was Ralph's sense of irony, um, probably not, but it's a nice thought. Of course, the joint was not the only foreign organization to seize the opportunity to re-engage co-ethnics or co-religionists. The Ukrainian diaspora, particularly in Canada, was very eager to revive Ukrainian national consciousness and Ukrainian culture. The Baltic diasporas, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, in Germany and in the United States, actually contributed one president of Latvia at least, I think she came from Canada, one head of the Estonian Armed Forces, he was a retired colonel of the United States Army, and one foreign minister of Armenia, Rafi Hovanisyan, whose father is a retired professor of Armenian studies at UCLA. So there was this re-migration from the diaspora of people directly into the successor governments of the USSR. Christian evangelical groups were trying to bring their message of salvation to what they saw as a huge potential mass of believers. Israel, of course, regarded Soviet Jewry, then numbering between one and a half and two million or two and a half million, as an enormous reservoir of potential aliyah. Haredim, ultra-Orthodox Jews, saw Soviet Jews as in need of spiritual revival, as did Chabad, of course. The reform or progressive Jewish movement became involved in reviving their understanding of Judaism in the former Soviet Union. Modern Orthodox and conservative movements were more modest in their activities and those activities waned fairly quickly. Chabad and the joint could point to relatively long histories in the USSR. The last Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneelsen was born in Ukraine and the movement originated in the 18th century in 
uh, what is now Belarus. Ralph Goldman reported that in the fall of 1988, when he attended services in Moscow, as if to point out the longevity of JDC's legitimacy, quote, after the service, a man sought me out to tell me that his mother, whose name was Sokol, had worked for AgroJoint. She told him that if he ever encountered a representative of the joint, to thank him. I actually sat in the office of the joint in Lviv, capital of West Ukraine, some years ago. And a rather tough looking burly guy walks in the door, a man probably in his 60s or 70s, and says rather gruffly to the joint representative, tell me, is this the same joint that sent food to us in Ukraine during the famine? And the joint, said, the joint man said, yes, yes. The Haladamor, the great famine that killed between two and three million people in Ukraine, mostly Ukrainians, but some Jews as well. The joint sent food, not only to Jews, but to Ukrainians. The man ran over to the JDC guy. They both embraced very strongly and both had tears in their eyes. This man, now elderly, remembered that as a child, he and his mother had survived due to the joint. Unsurprisingly, there was and continues to be competition as well as cooperation among these foreign ethnic and religious entrepreneurs, as I would call them. Ethnic diasporas are divided amongst themselves as to what should be done. Among the Jews, there were two major fissures or divides well into the 1990s. The Israelis and particularly the Jewish agency, which some had argued had lost its raison d'etre already by 1968, when the Israeli government established Misrada Klita, the Office of, or the Ministry of Immigrant Absorption, what was the agency supposed to do? The Jewish agency saw an opportunity. Here was a huge public that we can bring to Israel. However, increasingly, Jews opted not to go to Israel from the Soviet Union. In 1989, when Gorbachev lifted restrictions on emigration, 71,000 Jews emigrated, left the USSR, but only 12,000 went to Israel. 83% chose to go to North America. And the Israelis were furious. They were angry at these so-called Noshrim dropouts, people who had left the USSR with visas to go to Israel, and in the transit point at Vienna I said, no, I don't wanna to go to Israel. I'd rather go to the United States. They were transferred to Italy where Hayas and the joint supported them for a few months until they could immigrate to the United States. As a matter of fact, after the United States essentially barred emigration from the Soviet Union claiming in, um, what was it, 1989, in the Reagan administration that Jews were no longer refugees. They had a place to go. They could go to Israel freely. Why should we take them? Why should the United States take them? In, um, 1989, yeah, I said, the Americans stopped taking them in really. And by 1990, an agreement had been reached between the Israelis and the Americans that the United States would no longer take them unless they had first degree relatives here. In 1990, 185,000 Soviet immigrants arrived in Israel. Tremendous growth in the Aliyah and approximately 150,000 others came to Israel in the following year. But there was another choice. When America closed and Israel was the only option, Germany opened. 
between 2002 and 2004, more Soviet Jews went to Germany than went to Israel. You can make of that what you want, but from a Jewish population of 20,000, the German Jewish population has risen to 200,000. Two concluding points. I wanna reflect briefly on multiple ironies of this whole story. Glasnost allowed freedom of expression and perestroika allowed the reconstruction of public Jewish life. It also allowed the surfacing of visible, aggressive, militant, dangerous anti-Semitism. Groups such as Pamyat, the Russian nationalist organization, which means uh, memory, explicitly anti-Semitic. Here's, here's a great irony. I attended that Va'ad Congress in December of 1989 and Pamyat stood outside of the hall where delegations from hundreds of Jewish organizations had come together to found this Ruth Roof organization, this national organization uniting all Jews. Pamyat with explicit anti-Semitic posters demonstrated outside of the hall, but the hall was guarded. By whom? Not so much the police, but by Ruch, a Ukrainian nationalist organization which had found common cause with the Jews after centuries of hostility between these two peoples. Hard to understand the complexities and internal contradictions. A second irony, for the first time, the Jews fear that the state is weakening under Gorbachev. The Jews had always feared the strong state which had oppressed them. But now things seem to be going out of control. And if the government loses power, who knows what will rise out of the cesspools? Who knows who will be storming the government institutions? Who knows whether the experiences of 1918, 1921 will not be repeated? and the rising, the spontaneous rising of people in a multilateral war will fix on the Jews as their enemies. This led to what I call the panic migration and explains these large numbers of people who left the country in 1989-91. And the final irony is that just when the possibility of reconstructing public Jewish life arises, when you open schools, newspapers, theaters, social clubs, Jewish cultural associations in hundreds of cities. Just at that point, the people who would be most likely to rebuild Jewish life, young, Jewishly conscious, active, energetic, these are the people who disproportionately emigrate, leaving behind the elderly, the disadvantaged in so many dimensions and leaving the joint and Chabad and other organizations to care for them. The final word about the, let's call it the Vladimir Putin era, which began in 2000. In the previous decade, 1991-2000, the feckless, often inebriated Boris Yeltsin had taken apart much of the Soviet structure. And curiously enough, there was a very high Jewish presence in his government. When Putin came to power in 2000, his agenda was to make order in the country, to bring it to economic stability, and to get rid of those individuals who had made unimaginable fortunes by taking advantage of the chaos in the economy that existed after the fall of the USSR. 
the so-called oligarchs. Now, many of them happened to be Jewish. And he was determined to break the back of this group of people, such as Boris Berezovsky, Vladimir Gusinsky, who controlled the major television networks, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was the head of Yukos Oil, the largest single oil company in the country, possibly in the world, his assistant, uh, Leonid Nevzlin, and many others. Going after them, and he really went after them to the point that some of them, Khodorkovsky was imprisoned, I think, for nine years. Berezovsky fled to England, where he died under mysterious circumstances in 2013. Nevzlin had to leave the country because he was indicted for murder. This created the false impression that Putin was going after the Jews. Putin did not. Putin, from childhood, was very close to Jews. His judo instructor was Jewish. His neighbors, friendly neighbors, were Jewish. He bought an apartment for his first German teacher. Who she had moved to Netanya in Israel. He bought her an apartment. There's absolutely no way that he's an anti Semite, but he could have been perceived as such. So, what did he do? Very clever. The Russian Jewish Congress, which had succeeded the VAD as this roof organization and which was funded by these oligarchs, the Russian Jewish Congress had associated itself with a man they called the chief rabbi of Russia. Putin said, no, we have to get rid of the Russian Jewish Congress. Yeah, it can continue to exist, but it won't have much funding because I got rid of all those oligarchs. And this chief rabbi, I need my own rabbi. Putin needs a Rebbe. And he got a Rebbe, a Chabad Rebbe, an Italian-born, Brooklyn-trained, Beryl Lazar, whom he made the chief rabbi of Russia, and he made the organization of Chabad, the Federation of Jewish Communities of Russia, the representative of Russian Jewry. Lazar is your quintessential Jew. Ayid, mit abot, mit peis, mit a schwarzen hut. A Jew with a, a beard and, and, and earlocks and a black hat. What could be more Jewish than Putin posing with the chief rabbi, sending Rosh Hashanah greetings to the entire Jewish population? You can't conceive of this man as an anti-Semite. Chabad has a policy of going along with whoever is in power, however odious that power might be to others. So this is a marriage of convenience. Chabad has basically, I think, not succeeded in its religious mission, but like the joint with whom it cooperates, it has succeeded in providing welfare to those who need it. Avra, if you could show the last two slides. The joint has been instrumental in um, setting up these chesed organizations. Look at the kitchen of an elderly Jew in Ukraine. Obviously, she needs help. And these chesed organizations, welfare or charity, however you want to interpret it, have been very active in providing legal, medical help, food, cultural activities, organization, uh, all of this sponsored by the JDC. I don't want to turn this into a commercial for the JDC, even though I firmly believe in the cause, but there is a desperate need for reasons I think that I have outlined. And uh, it's not just the elderly and the needy, it's the younger people whose activities are being inspired to some extent funded. Abra, could you give us the next two slides? Uh, kids like this, who are learning the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, using material provided by the joint. Or the next slide, young people 
right next to the JDC library and the, the joint sponsored the translation into Russian and the publication of, I think of at least 150 classic Jewish titles, making those works accessible to kids like this who gather for social occasions as well. Jewish public communal life has revived to a greater or lesser degree in most former Soviet states, but it has been vitiated by emigration, steep increases in marriage of Jews to non-Jews, where today about four out of five Jews who marry are not marrying Jews, a very low rate of fertility, maybe one child per family, and a high mortality rate. The internal financial capacity of most Jewish communities has not developed to the point of self-sufficiency. And the joint spends, if I'm not mistaken, about 40% of its budget of $343 million on the former Soviet Union. Abra, you could take down the slide. Nevertheless, think about it. A century ago, American Jews were helping Soviet Jews. America Ratavit Alamen. The joint was providing relief. Now, Soviet Jews are paying back, not with money, but with their skills, their talents, their energies in the United States, in Germany, and most of all, in the Jewish state, which within the foreseeable future will be the largest Jewish population in the world. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much. That was incredible. Just incredible. Just as an aside, before we go to the Q and A, about two weeks ago, the um, the JDC archives presented a film called Refusenik, which doesn't re it has some of the things that these said, but so many other things that it was mainly about the Refusenik movement, and it was not not this topic at all. But if you missed it. We found out at the very end of the program that you can get it on Amazon Prime. So I think it would be a great opportunity. If you didn't see our film, you're going to miss Amir Shavi, which was one of the highlights. But nevertheless, I highly recommend that you see it. So um, now we will turn to the Q&A. We have several questions. The first one is from Ellen Heller. And her question is, do you think that Stalin's anti-joint policy and anti-Jews beginning around 1948 influenced the imprisonment of Raoul Wallenberg in the FSU after the war? No. Okay. I'll tell you why, Judge. Um, Wallenberg was arrested in 44, 45, 45. And we have some evidence that anti-Semitism began officially after the Battle of Stalingrad was won in February of 1943. That's a long story. But open anti-Semitism did not emerge until 48. Wallenberg, and I certainly don't know the inside story, appears to have been arrested under suspicion that he was an agent of Western governments, not just the Swedes, because he was a Swedish citizen, but that he was acting on behalf of some of the Western allies. But the chronology indicates to me that his arrest was not a consequence of anti-Semitism, but of the growing suspicion, even paranoia of the West by Stalin. And, you know, this eventually becomes part of the Cold War propaganda. I bet you didn't know 
that baseball was invented in Siberia and not by Abner Doubleday or whoever else is enshrined in Cooperstown, New York. I bet you didn't know that television was invented in Russia before it came to the United States. There was this crazy Russian chauvinism which went hand in hand with suspicion of the West. I'll give you one example and I'll quit. In 1951, there was a trial in Czechoslovakia of uh, the so-called Slansky group. Rudolf Slansky was the first secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and he happened to be Jewish. And 11 others were arrested, nine of whom I believe were Jews. And one of the Jews, Bejich Geminder, this is in the transcript of the trial. He had been a long-term communist, but the judge asked him, is it true that you have a brother in Santiago de Chile? And he said, yes, your honor, it is true. And what does your brother do in Santiago de Chile? My brother is a dentist. Aha! A brother and dentist in Chile shows you're a Western spy. The sugar, but that was the mentality. Okay, question number two. This is from an anonymous attendee. So is Putin good for the Jews or bad for the Jews now? You know, it reminds me of the old Jewish joke of the anical of the grandson who comes home rushes into the house in the apartment in the Bronx and yells excitedly, Zeta, Zeta, Babe Ruth hit a home run and the Yankees won. And the Zeta turns to the kid and he says, she's good for the Yidden or the Nisht? Is it good for the Jews or not? Well, he's certainly much better for the Jews than Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and so on, as a whole. Of course, he has his Jewish allies and his Jewish opponents. Not surprisingly, many Jews in, in Russia today sympathize with the opposition to Putin on political grounds. And if we had polls which we don't, to indicate how much support there is for Alexei Navalny, for example, among Jews as compared to others, I think for a variety of reasons, you'd find a high proportion of support for the critics of Putin rather than Putin himself. But all can agree that as far as public Jewish life, Jewish culture are concerned, uh, Putin has probably been the best that one could expect, not only in Russia, but in any other country. Mm. Crazy. Okay, this one is from Ethel Gerhagorin. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I wanted to know if there were other organizations the joint worked with, particularly during the post-World War II years to support destitute Jews? The joint conducted some activities, I would say clandestinely and indirectly after World War II in the Soviet Union. Uh, the joint did get back into Eastern Europe following the war in a major way certainly in countries such as Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, and so on. And possibly, I don't know the details, but possibly through those countries, there was some assistance rendered. There was a program called some, Relief in Transit, something like that. Uh, so there was some assistance, but remember the joint was officially absent for, from the USSR from 1938 to 1988, half a century. And so the joint did work with some organizations, including some governments who had better access to Soviet Jews and uh, provided support in a variety of ways. Okay. 
I think one of the things that um, Amir pointed out was that um, after the time when the, when the refusenik movement, that um, the joint sent sent food packages and packages of goods that the refuseniks could sell on the black market to earn living after they were denied their jobs. So that was one of the things they did. The next question is from our new executive director, Ariel Zwang. Thank you for the great program. Were there challenges or difficulties with the joint worked with ARA to bring aid to Jews in Russia? Not as far as I know. Um, I haven't probed that question, but I know that in the period that you're discussing, the joint relief or some part of it was channeled through ARA, it was channeled through the American Relief Administration. And there was cooperation, uh, not only in providing welfare, but for example, I think there was some cooperation in investigation of atrocities that were committed in what is now Ukraine and Belarus, or Belarus, um, between ARA and JDC representatives. So it seems to have been an amicable and fruitful relationship, just as AgroJoint and ORT, which we call, what do we call it in America? What do we call Organization for Rehabilitation and Training? It's not, that's an American adaptation. <laughs> ORT started in Russia in the 19th century, and ORT stands in Russian for Orchestra Remesionova Truda, the Society for Crafts Work, uh, because its mission, as it remains today, and it's also active in the former Soviet Union, was to provide vocational training for Jews who would otherwise have no profession. So ORT joint, just as today, joint cooperates with the International Fellowship for Christians and Jews, with the Claims Conference, uh, with the National Organization of Federations, who changes its name every Monday and Donnerstag. Uh, yes. Great. I remember a few years ago, we went to, um, German with the joint, Germany and the Baltic states. And when we were in Dusseldorf, we had we went to Shabbat and we met a lot of the people in the Jewish community. Tons and tons of German, um, former Russians that were now living in Germany. And one of the issues for them, as I recall them saying, was that they they moved to Germany because when the the whole socialist system was collapsing, they feared that they would not have the social welfare programs that they were used to in, in Russia that they would then get in Germany. And so that, that was part of the reason why they went there. They weren't law. percent of German Jews today, so-called German Jews, are not Yekis as we call them, right. but are Russian speakers. And their reasons for moving to Germany are, I suppose, manifold. One is what you mentioned, Debbie. Um, the Germans were exceedingly generous in their welfare benefits. And we can understand why in light of how they treated world Jewry during the 1940s. A second uh, motivation seems to have been that a fairly large proportion of those who went to Germany had family members, often spouses who were not Jewish. And they believed that they would be disadvantaged in Israel. And on the other hand, they could not get into the United States. So Germany, the wealthiest country in Western Europe uh, would be an obvious choice. Um, I found it intriguing to talk to some Soviet Jewish veterans of World War II who had migrated to Germany. And impolitely, I asked them, actually it's the title of a book in German to which I contribute, how could you? <laughs> you were here before, you were here in 45. 
They tried to kill you. You won. How could you come now? Of course, don't judge your fellow person until you stand in his or her shoes. I had no right to say that, to be honest. But the answer was not implausible. These are different Germans. They are. Let's hope. Right. Let's see if there's any more questions. Okay. This is also from Ellen Heller. I have heard that Israel and certain American Jewish leaders placed pressure on the United States not to take the Jews so that they would come directly to Israel. Is there any credence to this? Yes. The papers have not been made public as far as I know, but there was an agreement between Israel and the United States that in return for Attorney General Edward Meese, stating that Soviet Jews no longer qualified for refugee status and therefore could be admitted to the United States as immigrants outside the immigration quotas. And they could be admitted as refugees from communism, as Hungarians were admitted in 56, as Cubans were admitted after 1961, in return for that, which indirectly forced emigres from the USSR to go to the one country that accepted them unconditionally, Israel, the Israelis would agree to conduct talks with the Palestine Liberation Organization, with the PLO. And um, Mies made his finding not in a strictly legal context, I, maybe the judge will be disappointed by that, but in a political context. Mm -hmm. And um, Israel, headed at the time, if I'm not mistaken, by uh, Yitzhak Shamir, the prime minister, agreed to such talks in return for this change in American policy. Right. I think there's one more. This is anonymous. I know you have done comparative work on the Russian Jews in the US, Germany, and Israel. How would you compare their lives today? Uh, I.e., how successful they have been in each of the countries? I don't know about Germany. And there are two interesting questions to ask about that. I don't know how successful they have been economically, socially, and culturally. And I don't know what has happened to them Jewishly. I do know a little bit about Israel and the United States. And I would say, generally, they have been incredibly successful. How so? It's fair to say, I believe, that Israel's high-tech revolution could not have happened with the inflow of 1.3 million Soviet Jews from 1971 through 2007 or eight. Forty percent of them have some form of higher education. Now it's true, Israel does not need professors of Marxism-Leninism. Israel did not need specialists in Lithuanian linguistics. Israel could not absorb many railroad engineers or bridge builders. But those people had skills, education, and mainly ambition that could be transformed, channeled, often misused. Physicists became night watchmen because how many physicists do seven universities in the country need? But eventually they found their ways into computers, high tech that children certainly did, uh, not to speak of the great cultural contributions ra ranging from ice hockey teams to gymnasts, to theater, to ballet, to classical music and so on. I mean, they've transformed Israeli society and in my subjective opinion, much for the better. 
in the United States, um, ironically, the United States is the most information deprived country because of our ineptitude and disinterest. We don't even know how many Soviet Jews have come to this country, whereas any Israeli or German official can tell you. Let's assume somewhere between 300,000 and half a million. That's a pretty wide range. My impression is that again, the importation of a highly educated, urbanized, ambitious, energetic immigration has been a great boon to the United States. And I have had the privilege of, for the last six years, teaching Russian speaking, Russian born, young Jewish adults in an organization called the Jewish Parents Academy. I can't tell you what nachas, you know what that means in Russian, right? <laughs> what, what satisfaction I derive from watching these young people who are sending their children to Jewish education, who are becoming teachers, pharmacists, engineers, going into finance, nishparons uh, gedacht, law, medicine, and their mobility. I, I once did a survey in Chicago and I asked people to write down the zip codes of the per places they first lived when they arrived in Chicago and their present zip codes. That was an easy way of tracking upward mobility. It's been an astounding success. And the poor old Soviet Union has lost the successor countries have lost an, a resource that is replaceable, but is enormous. And that's the price they paid for decades of mistreatment. We are gonna take one more final question from Betty Kane, who says, thank you so much for your most insightful remarks. The biggest irony is the large amount of Israelis moving to Germany. I'm not sure if Ms. Kane is spelling insightful S-I-G-H or C-I-T-E, but okay. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, no one knows, but I've heard that 30,000 Israelis live in Berlin, maybe. It's complicated. Some are there because they are alienated from current Israeli policy, both domestic and foreign. Some are there because they feel that their life chances are better, especially if they have origins or ancestry in the European Union. In other words, an Israeli whose grandparents came from Germany or Poland or Hungary can reclaim citizenship in those countries. And at least until now, there's been free transit among them. Israel has exported a lot of emigres to the United States, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago. There are many so-called Yordim, not a nice term because we say people who go to Israel are olim, they are people who go upward, and people who leave Israel are yordim, they're people who are going downward. And as late as the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, um, we heard very uncomplimentary things. He called those who dropped out in Vienna, Nipola Chelnemushot, very hard to translate, means sort of the dregs and the leavings people who are inferior. Israeli attitudes have changed. It's a global world. The scientist in Silicon Valley, who is an Israeli, the Nobel Prize winner who lives in the United States, who is an Israeli, the Yitzhak Perlmans of this world, 
Can you blame them for seeking larger opportunities, better academic institutions, greater cultural fields of play? You can say being an Israeli should take priority. You can say advancing your own talents and careers should take priority. But it's a world in which people are increasingly moving back and forth across borders. And of course, there is continuing Aliyah going to Israel as well as going out from Israel. And let's be honest, in times of economic difficulty, such as the late 1960s in Israel until the 1967 war, that was the primary driver of emigration. The success of Israel, at least temporary in 1967, was a big incentive to go to Israel. So these are dynamic population movements. And I don't know that we can do much about them, whatever our preferences may be. V, thank you so, so much. My I also want to I also want to thank Linda Levy, who made all of this possible, Isabel Rohr and Avra Cohen, and the whole archive staff. These webinars and lectures and programs have just been fantastic.